Well, they're just kind of substituting this morning and helping with the PowerPoint and uh, just learning how to do it as well. So uh, thank you for your patience, but I appreciate them stepping in at the last moment. Well, our message today is finding a way back home. We'll be looking at the story of the prodigal son, and I hope that as we share this together, some new thoughts will come to surface. Maybe some things you never thought about before as you looked at this particular passage of scripture. But to begin with, how many remember the TV series Lost? Okay, some of you probably watched that particular series. It's a group of about 45 people who are on a plane. The plane crashes, actually 45 people who survived the plane crash. But they crash on a deserted island. And they have to learn how to work together, which turns out to be a pretty big assignment. But there's more to Lost than just a fancy remake of Gilligan's Island. The characters of Lost are very well developed, and the series was filled with suspense and intrigue. So I'm told, I only watched about one or two episodes of it. And of course, the ending was kind of a shock to faithful viewers. And I need to say this, I'm afraid it's going to be the same kind of ending for the new TV series, Manifest. Just let you know, don't be upset when you get to the end. However, to lead us into today's message, I want to introduce to you Jack. Jack was one of the first characters you saw on the show. He was a doctor. He also was a man who was extremely patient, a man of civility. And because of that, he begins the show as being the leader of the group. But nonetheless, Jack too is lost. Not just simply on this strange and nightmarish island, he was lost because of the strained relationship he had with his own dad. A relationship that he was never able to repair. A relationship strained to the point that Jack spent much of his adult life actually running it from his dad, separating himself from his father. So with that thought in mind, I want to kind of allow it to help us segue into today's scripture passage. As we begin to reflect on the prodigal son, a very familiar story, I want you to know that there's much about the story that you and I alike can identify with. The word prodigal actually means restlessly wasteful. How many have ever been restlessly wasteful in your lifetime? Okay, the rest of you need to come to the altar afterward. <laughs> I think we can relate to periods in our life where we just kind of wasted, squandered our time, our talents, our treasures, maybe even those opportunities God gave us to share our testimony to someone. And then in regard to that, we also might relate to the prodigal's selfish intents. He had this proneness to want the best of everything, no matter who or what had to be sacrificed in order for him to get it. He wanted it, and as the expression goes today, he wanted it now. Now, I know you don't want to raise your hand for this. My hand's going up. There's times in my own life I've been probably pretty selfish. And if you don't believe me, talk to my wife. She will let you know. Maybe, just maybe, we can relate to the prodigal's false sense of security. In this case, it was money. Money to him would buy happiness and fame and success. Money would give him a piece of heaven. Well, you know, a lot of times it may not be money, but we put other things in the place that rightfully belongs to our Lord, don't we? We substitute God with something else that we think is going to be more satisfying. And that's what the prodigal was doing. Taking the father out of the picture and putting something else in his place. You know, when I was growing up, and I don't know when the bumper sticker came out, but it might have been in the 70s, there was a bumper sticker a lot of Christians put on the tail uh, bumper of their car that simply said, Jesus is my co-pilot. Yep. You guys remember that? Yep. Even as a kid, I didn't like that sticker. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus needs to be the pilot. You need to switch seats. He's not a co-pilot. He needs to be in charge. 
And if he's not, if you put anything else there, even if you put yourself there, it's going to bring emptiness. You know, the Bible speaks that we as Christians should be of one mind. It's okay as long as it's my mind that you're following. Okay? And you know that's fun. It's not what the Bible's saying. To be of one mind means our focus is always on Christ. That's what brings harmony. That's what brings unity within the family. And then one other area of identification before we actually look at the scriptures this morning. I'm sure that we can relate to the prodigal's nightmare. His world suddenly and unexpectedly came crashing down. Listen to this. His fame could not save him. The money which he thought was his God could not rescue him. His success, because he tried to draw many people around him due to his financial position, his success could not redeem him. As the word of God would say, he stood in the balances and was found wanting. You know, three things will quickly bring you and I to our minds. The same as the prodigal, and they are these, pride, dissatisfaction, and greed. In fact, one usually leads into the other. It starts with a spirit of pride, and then we become dissatisfied with things around us and we feel we deserve better, and then also become envious, greedy of the things that we want to put our hands on and control and actually claim for our very own. So let's take a look at our scripture today. First of all, let's note the son's request, and I added the scripture in your sermon notes this morning if you want to follow along. Verses 11 and 12. <coughs> to illustrate the point further, Jesus told him this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Man, did you pick up the arrogance in that? Notice it begins by saying the son didn't ask his dad for his share. He told his dad. And he also, in this particular command, was simply saying, I can't wait until you die. I want it now. Now, some of you here may remember this illustration I used a while back, but one day my grandson came and jumped on my lap and said, Grandpa, make like a frog. Totally confused me, you know? I'm like, what are you talking about? Make like a frog. Why? Well, mom and dad says, once you croak, we'll be rich. <laughs> now, that's just a joke. It never happened. My kids know, my grandkids know I'm dirt poor, so it wouldn't matter what happened to me. However, this is what the son was saying. He said, I want my money. I want you to croak. Actually, I want my money now before you croak. You're taking too long with this croaking business. So by imitating this attitude, he caused division within the family. He took his part of the estate, showing tremendous arrogance and disrespect for his father's authority as head of the house. Let me just go ahead and put it in the vernacular. He was saying, hey, I want everything you have, Dad. I want it now, and as far as I'm concerned, drop dead. That's pretty much what the son was saying. You know, in a more upfront and personal sense, how often have we treated God in the same vein? Now, maybe we don't come out as vocal or as boisterous as the prodigal, but think of this just for a moment. And again, I'm speaking to myself. I'm not just preaching to you. The message is coming right back and hitting me square in the face. How many times have we wanted the best the Christian life had to offer? We want all the promises, all the blessings that we can get from the Christian life, and we want it now. We don't want to buy our time, we want it now. And if God begins to shower his blessings on us, then we would simply say, okay, God, now that was great, goodbye. Leave me alone. Get lost. It's almost like the genie and the magic lamp theology. You kind of rub the lamp, the genie comes up, you ask what you want, get what you want, tell the genie to go back to the lamp until you need him again. And you know, we're, we're laughing about it, we're chuckling about it. Think about it, have, have we really done that? Not long ago, we preached a series on Christian 
atheist. Saying that you're a Christian, telling people you're a Christian, but then going out and acting as if God doesn't exist. Well, you know, the prodigal son had this kind of mentality. There are moments that we feel we can manage God's possessions quite well on our own. We don't need God, we just want what he has to offer. But then, note the young man's ruin. We continue at verse 13 through 16. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. I want to pause right here because a lot of times we think that he ate pig food. You know, he's in the pig pen eating out of the pig trough, but here it says he couldn't even do that. If he deprived the pigs of their food, he'd have to face the owner, and he'd have to pay <coughs> him for what he did. It says no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Now you see how this world came caving in, right? How everything came undone unexpectedly came undone for him. But I'm going to let you know that the prodigal son's ruin happened long before he ever left home. It was the attitude of his heart. It was the disposition of his character. Long before his money ran out, he was already displaying the fact that ruin was in the making. The Bible's clear about this. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you're already toying with thoughts that don't align with Christ, you're setting yourself up for fail. You're setting yourself up for doom. And here's how I figure it, so kind of follow along with me if you don't mind. I think you became dissatisfied with home. And for the sake of my illustration, let home represent the church, the house of God. So he became dissatisfied with the house of God. Then he became discontented with his job or responsibilities of being a part of the family of God. His moral and spiritual responsibilities. He just kind of threw to the wind. I don't need this anymore. And because of being dissatisfied with the church, discontented with the things that he knows is right, he now becomes disenchanted with God himself disenchanted with the Father. And in the midst of his rebellion and arrogance, man, what a life that was wasted. He wasted his time. What did he accomplish while he was out there, quote unquote, living wildly? When all was said and done, what did he have to show for it? He lost his treasures. He crawled back home a pauper without a penny to his name. He lost his testimony. <laughs> I am who in this place wants to follow the example of the prodigal son? Who wants to end up feeding pigs? Well, some people like that. They're, they're pig farmers, I realize that. But I mean, can you imagine being so desperate that even the food the pigs were eating was appealing to you? That's how bad it was? Who wants to kind of follow that pattern? So his whole testimony was ruined. And then relationships. He had no friends. The only friends he had is when he had money. Yeah. Yeah. And he was spending it on them. But once his money was gone, man, his fickle friends, fair weather friends were gone as well. They went out the door. They didn't love him or appreciate him for who he was. They only appreciated him for what he had. And that brings us to the final point, and that is the son's recovery. Notice 17 through 32 of Luke 15. And just a little side note, Luke 15 
It's entitled, really, The Chapter of Lost Things. But the most precious comes to the prodigal son. But there's a lost coin, a lost sheep, and now a lost son. So he returned home to his father while he was still a long way off. His father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home and heard music and dancing in the house, he asked one of the servants what was going on. Ah, your brother's back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've, I've slain for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. In all that time you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fat and calf? Notice the attitude of the older brother right away. He doesn't even claim the younger as a sibling. He says, Dad, it's your son. <laughs> no relation to me. I don't, I don't have anything to do with him now. And that was true back in that culture. The father said to him, Look, dear son, you've always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. Though we had to celebrate this happy day, notice the twist, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost. But now it's father. The father says, he's your brother. I don't care what you try to do to distance yourself from him. He's still your brother. Some things that captivated me in this latter part of the scripture is the fact that the prodigal came to his senses. To me, that's a powerful expression. It's like the somebody came out of some kind of stupor or coma or terrifying nightmare. He realized that his life was in grave danger and there was only one ray of hope. And that ray of hope was, guess what? Going back home. Going back to the very place he was discontented with. Going back and finding the love that was always there that somehow he overlooked, he missed. That home, back in the presence, of his father. And there's a part of this text I have often glossed over, never really looked at it in the way that it all of a sudden came to my attention. And that is, when he came to his senses, he simply said, you know what? I'm going to go back as a slave or a servant, however you want to word it, because my dad takes good care of his servants. My dad takes good care of the slaves. They are well fed. They're worked right. And I don't mind coming at the lowest level. He can deny me sonship. That's okay. I forfeited it anyway. I just want to come in at that lowest level because I know he'll still care for me, even as a servant. And I'll have something to eat. I'll have a place to lay my head. I'll have protection. Man, that's powerful. I, I never saw that that way before. So returning home, Wow. Even though he couldn't have sonship, or didn't think he was going to have sonship, he still knew that in his father's house, he'd have all he ever dreamed of having. But you know, a question comes, what would have happened if the older brother saw him coming down the road and not the father? Do any of you even have an idea? I'm just going to go by culture because this is a parable that Jesus is sharing. But in that culture, what the younger son did destroyed the family name. He embarrassed both dad and older brother. The reputation was gone. 
Gossip within the community definitely was running rampant. And the younger brother, if he tried to come home and the older brother found him, would have killed him. Would have taken his life and felt right by doing that. The town would have felt right for him doing that because now he's making right the family name. That's why the father, every day, looked down that road because he was going to be the first one to grab his son if his son ever came home. He wasn't going to let anybody else, not the townspeople, not even the older brother, have a shot at that boy. He was going to come, wrap his arms around him, and protect him. It's amazing that comes out of this story. And my mind went to Isaiah 6, or 9, 6, rather. You're familiar with the verse. It's usually a Christmas verse. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Why do I share that with you this morning? Because if you're struggling down this prodigal road, Jesus is everything you need. Everything. Jesus is called wonderful for the dullness of life. Counselor for the dilemmas of life. Mighty God for the dangers of life. Everlasting Father for every stage of life. And Prince of Peace for the disturbances of life. <coughs> As the son came back, you find that there's a brokenness in his heart and there's repentance, there's humbleness. He simply says, I have sinned against God in heaven and against my own family. And Father, would you just take me in as a servant? I don't care if I have to sleep in the shed. I don't care where you place me. If I can be back under your care again, that's enough for me. Well, the son returns. But more than that, we discover the father awaits. There he is, looking down that road, ready to embrace his son. In fact, it says the father ran to his son to put his arms around him. I'm going to ask the praise team to come back to the platform right now. There's a story of old about a young man that almost did exactly what the prodigal did in our parable. He made shipwreck of his family life. I mean, the things he said about his mom and dad, getting involved with drugs and alcohol, causing all kinds of pain in the household. And finally, he decided that he could do better on his own anyway. He didn't need uh, their counsel. He didn't need their direction. So he took off to a distant place. And the day came also. He came to his own senses. He wrote a letter home. And in the letter, he simply said on such an occasion, he was going to get on a bus and head back home. He said, now, Mom and Dad, you know the bus goes around a bend, and I'm going to be looking at the oak tree in our backyard as it goes around that bend. And if you would tie a white ribbon to a branch on that oak tree, I'll know I've been forgiven. I'll get off the bus in town and come home. But if there's nothing on the oak tree, I understand. I I've hurt you both very deeply. I'll just stay on the bus and go to the next destination. Well, the day came, he knew that they probably already had the letter well in advance, got on the bus, trembling, I'm sure as you can imagine, wondering what he's going to find when he goes around the bed, Went around the bed, and sure enough, there was no white ribbon tied to a branch on the old tree. The whole tree was covered in white. Every branch had something on it to show that they wanted their son home, that they loved him, that they had forgiven him. And you may not be aware of this, but that true account is really where Tony Orlando and Don got the idea for tying yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. <laughs> kind of amazing. Well, my friends, Jesus never gives up on us. Revelation 3.20 says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. 
I pray right now that if you're on that prodigal path, you come home. Because you don't have to be lost any longer. Simply come to your senses, confess your sins as the prodigal did, see God as your hope, see God as the source of love, and then guess what? The best part, anticipate his warm embrace, his loving arms around you. As we stand and close in song, the altar is always opened, and we welcome you. If God's been stirring in your heart, and maybe you feel like you've kind of been shifting down this path, we bid you come. He's waiting with arms wide open. Right now?